We will be offering live one-hour webinars throughout the academic year on relevant topics delivered by some of our most dynamic faculty members. Your audio has been turned off to eliminate any disruption from background noise. Additionally, please note that you cannot view the other participants who have logged in. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available at a later date on our Tufts Alumni Playlist on YouTube. If you'd like to ask a question, please type it into the Q&A box in the lower right portion of your screen. If there are any questions that go unaddressed before our 1 p.m. stop time, we will share as many answers as possible with you in an email after the webinar. It is now my pleasure to turn the presentation over to our featured speaker, Ming Chow. Hey, good afternoon everyone. I'm Ming and today I'm going to talk about my favorite topic which is cybersecurity. Uh, I'm Senior Lecturer at the Department of Computer Science. That's my email address and that's also my Twitter handle and you can find me pretty easily on, uh, on, on Twitter. Uh, I'm not on Facebook. And uh, I hope today will be one of the most sobering conversations and talks that you will hear. So, what is cybersecurity? Well, cybersecurity, the old traditional textbook way of looking at it is think of three letters, C, I, and A, the CIA triad, protecting the confidentiality of uh, information system data transfer, the integrity and availability. So that's an old traditional definition. Um, but the key point about cybersecurity is uh, it's a very broad field. Um, a lot of people still make the mistake thinking, oh, cybersecurity? Oh, it's just a computer. It's just a technical and computing topic. Um, that is just a, that's a huge fallacy. And if you think about it, cybersecurity encompasses many, many different facets, uh, all, all disciplines, um, economics. For example, uh, an economic issue is, oh, why should, uh, if you're going to put security features in, say, a brand new car, why should uh, I pay more for, uh, for those features? Psychology, big issue, passwords, for example. Um, and this is going to be an issue that I'm going to hammer home quite a bit uh, in my presentation, um, just to show you the password problem and uh, password reuse. Uh, international relations, things like cyber war, um, you know, uh, conflicts. What is this thing called cyber norm, quote unquote? I hear that conversation going on all the time. Uh, law and business, uh, big issue, big topic that's going on right now. Um, that still kind of bothers me is cyber insurance. Huge, huge topic. So cybersecurity, very, very broad. And it encompasses so many different fields. And this, that itself makes the field just absolutely so difficult. Why cybersecurity? Um, make, put it in a very simple, it's, it's an international crisis right now. Um, goes without saying that you know, we depend on technology just so much in our lives now. Um, phone, video game systems, business, you name it. And uh, we are also still facing the same problems as we have from decades ago. And I want to speak a little bit about how I got into cybersecurity. And uh, it, was, uh, it was in 2004 here in Boston. So I graduated from Tufts, uh, my undergrad, in uh, 90, from, I went here for undergrad, 1998 to 2002, and I got my master's in computer science in 2002 to 2004. Um, you know, when I graduated with my master's, I said, you know, I want, want to make video games, I want to build video games, do something with computer graphics. Um, at that time, I was working as a, uh, as a web developer in, in, in Cambridge, uh, Massachusetts, and uh, I was given the opportunity to go to the Usenix annual conference uh, that was being held in Boston. It is um, the Advanced Computing Systems uh, Association big annual conference. And at that time, you know, I was doing web development and, uh, you know, where I was working was kind enough to send me, you know, you can take two training courses uh, at the conference. And I took a course on uh, software security and another one on system administration and, uh, and security. And at that time, I didn't even know that cybersecurity was a thing. I had no idea that this was even a career path. 
I only took one course in uh, my years as a student that was even remotely close to cybersecurity, which was cryptography. Which was cryptography. And, uh, but that doesn't tell you the whole scope of the cybersecurity field. So at the conference I met, uh, there were you know, two luminary speakers, Gary McGraw and Ed Felton. Um, Ed, uh, Gary was uh, the trainer for one of my workshops, and Ed was also one of the panel was was a panelist. Uh, and little did I know at that time, Gary McGraw would not only become uh, a friend for well over a decade now, but he would also become my mentor. Uh, Ed Felton uh, would later on be uh, chief technologist for the uh, Federal Trade Commission for the FTC and also now Deputy Chief Technology Officer for the United, for the United States. And uh, I credit them with even in, with introducing me to cybersecurity. They're also, both of them are also famous for a, a very fun and infamous quote in cybersecurity that is, if a user is presented the option of security or dancing pigs, the user will always pick dancing pigs. Uh, but the message at that time that Gary said was, and I quote, you know, we need to step up to the plate and educate people on technology, uh, technological issues, uh, you know, to be bipartisan and to talk to people who is curious. The point being, be a good citizen. So this was the message that really, really hooked me into cybersecurity. And again, this was in 2004. Now keep that in mind because now we're in 2019. So what has changed? What hasn't changed? And it's sad that a lot of what Gary and 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 Ed, what they mentioned in 2004, hasn't come into fruition at all. Uh, so what is cybersecurity looking right now? There are some things that are better. Uh, a lot of memory bugs and vulnerabilities, those have been solved. But there's still a lot, and I mean a lot, of vulnerabilities and cybersecurity issues that we face today that still were major issues when I learned about cybersecurity in 2004. Uh, old attacks are still very, very useful and still being widely used and very, very successful. Um, you know, companies and people are still thinking, oh, we can solve a lot of these cybersecurity problems by just throwing money at the problem. Uh, software and systems have become even more complex now, um, much more complicated. What makes it also even worse is the people who are building these software and systems still don't know basic security. Which also, you may be asking, well, we've been, face cybersecurity has been an issue for over a decade now, and people still don't know about these things, even like the, the software engineers and developers. Um, it also stems, it also roots into an education problem. Most computer science students don't take security. Um, also important to mention uh, in terms of uh, women in cybersecurity, uh, very, very low participation rate for, very, for, for reasons such as sexual harassment and, uh, and hiring and, and pay, list of things go on. And that doesn't help the cause, especially we're in a field right now that really is, you know, you hear about it all the time, that desperately need, that desperately need people. Uh, Security, the relationship between security and folks and business stakeholders, generally speaking, has, has been very poor for a long time. Um, communications and just not even under, not understanding trade off, all still major issues. And um, educating government uh, officials, still an issue. Um, a lot of hard questions not being asked. Um, you know, the citizenship is, is still definitely still a work in progress, needs serious improvement. And so I want to show you a dossier to, of sobering reality to prove the points that I have back here, uh, you know, that hammers home why we're still in a deep, deep hole when it comes to cybersecurity. 
So this was a report that was written by a, by a good colleague and friend of mine, Josh Abraham, a Praetorian. And they put together a report on cybersecurity engagements, uh, penetration tests. And the results were the top four attack vectors are still based, were well, they based off of credentials, stolen credentials, username and passwords. And here are your numbers. Uh, Dropbox, the year ago, and we still have a rash of these issues, is uh, password reuse. Uh, I'll give you an example how this works. So many people use the same password for many, many different services. So you have one major website that got, that got breached, LinkedIn, and all the credentials get dumped onto the dark web or somewhere or on, um, on the internet. And so they all get cacked. So you have a list of accounts, list of hacked password from LinkedIn. So what the attackers would do, they would use that same set of hacked username and password, use them from other sites like Dropbox. And this is exactly what happened, the password reuse problem a few years ago. It's still a big problem um, with many different websites and services such as, such as GitHub had recently had a, a major, had the same, same issue. So password reuse. You have pa username and password get hacked on web, one website, gets used onto another one. Why? People use the same password all the time. There's a great talk by Rob Joyce uh, on how they work and how they break into systems. And here it is, word for word, again, credentials. Um, especially the credentials of administrators and system uh, of, of anyone, administrator or people who have high levels of access. Um, also, which also doesn't help the cause, is hard-coded passwords. That is the username and passwords that are just baked into the software and you can't change it. That doesn't help the cause either because there's no way to change a password once everyone knows about it if it's already baked into the system or the software. And this is almost as good as just leaving the keys into the car. Um, Mirai, October 2016, that took down many, many uh, services such as GitHub, Spotify, Netflix, you name it. It was just overloading all the those systems and services because using hacked webcams um, and other internet of, uh, things devices. What happened, most of those devices all had hard-coded, not only had hard-coded username and password, but the password was just so simple to guess, like root root, admin password, root abc123. Okay. And so why are we still having, seeing all these issues? Why are people still making these mistakes? Well, here you go. This is from Veracode, um, based out of Burlington, Massachusetts. They do software security. And there it is, black and white. You know, developers just still don't, they, they just aren't trained in secure coding. They, they just don't know. And the culture of software development is developers, engineers, they don't think about security. They think about functionality, building functionality that people want without much terms of security uh, being considered. So where does this problem stem from? Well, oh, here's another one, you know. Uh, utility customers, your passwords being stored in plain text, not encrypted. So if someone gets a list of all the username and password, there you go. You know, it's there, plain text, black and white, you can just use them as it is. Um, these are just simple mistakes that are still being made. Why? Well, here's a big reason why. You take a look at, this is one of my favorite articles written by Kelly uh, Jackson Higgins is, most computer science curriculum, you go through four years of computer science or boot camp, developers, engineers, they don't talk about, you know, security. 
in any of the courses. Students don't take courses in cybersecurity. It's just not there. It's just not there in the, in the curriculum. Totally unlike uh, if you go uh, into civil environmental engineering. You see, at civil environmental engineering, you can't get your undergraduate degree in civil environmental engineering, you know, unless you have, you have to take, you have to learn things like health, safety, critical infrastructure, security. That's not the case in computer science. Okay. This illustrates, this graph right here illustrates uh, the complexity uh, of software. And uh, simple iOS application, uh, simple iPhone application can have thousands and thousands of lines of code. But when you get to like, comp like you know, operating systems such as Mac OS or Android or Windows, we're talking about tens of millions of lines of code, of computer code. And of course, when you have that many lines of computer code, you know, you're bound to have more bugs, more problems. It's almost impossible, it's impossible to have your eyes and ears on all millions and millions of lines of source code. And this is a quote from my dear colleague and chair of the Tufts Computer Science Department, Kathleen Fisher. You know, the attackers only have to find one weakness. Okay? The defenders, you know, plug every single hole, including the one they don't know about. Okay. And a few years ago, after I came home from, from DEF CON, The Hill ran this very nice, and, and Joe Uchi ran this very nice article about hacker conferences. At a lot of hacker conferences, there's a lot of emphasis on bright, shiny objects, hacks. But the problem is, if you take a look at all the vulnerabilities, all the major incidents that have, uh, had, that have occurred, you know, they're still using well-known techniques such as phishing, um, other forms, forms of fraud, and also known vulnerabilities, known security vulnerabilities that have been known for a long time, um, you know, where the patch has been, the software patch has been available, okay? And I wouldn't go so far to say it wouldn't take much, but which do these, you know, techniques that we've known for years still widely being used? And there's little emphasis, there's little focus on those things. But there's more focus on, oh, how to break this, how to break this, using this newest, newest techniques, newest techniques. While most of the incidents, all, you know, based off of well-known techniques and vulnerabilities that we've known for not just years ago, but from decades ago. Okay? About the issue with uh, women in cybersecurity, uh, pay your numbers. So, in November 2016, I went to a, a friend, Deidre Diamond, so she had a kickoff event for her venture called Brain Babe, uh, which was to not only uh, help and encourage more women to join cybersecurity, but she also explained what the real fourth of what the problems are. And here are the numbers: 10% of the security workforce, uh, cybersecurity workforce, is women. Um, you know, in terms of the leader leadership, uh, it's very very low. We're talking 1% women. And even worse, half of the women that even join cybersecurity end up leaving the industry for lots of different reasons, things, you know, especially things like sexual harassment. This is how big the problem is. These numbers, there you go. And, um, you know, this is coming at such a really bad time when there's always to talk about, oh, we need more uh, people involved uh, in cybersecurity and there's a talent shortage. There's a lot of uh, people who are just not giving, given the opportunities, and it doesn't help with these numbers either. Throwing money at the problem. One of my absolute favorites is from Jeremiah Grossman, wrote this a few years ago, 81 billion, not 81 million, 81 billion dollars later, you know, you spend all this money, but people, but you know, people still, three to five, three and five companies still expect to get breached even after spending all that money. So you may be wondering, you know, what about here in 2019? Has the numbers actually gotten any better? I mean, seriously, this can't be right, right? We're in 2019, wow, here you go. And this was uh, from just, well, last week. You know, 
a 424% increase in data breaches in 2018. 2018, 424% increase in the, over the previous year. So you just really ask yourself, like, you spent all that money for what? I mean, what problems are you really, really solving? Um, and it's really almost def it's deflating when you see numbers like when you see numbers like these. Um, when I around 2007, I remember there was a quote from the FBI that said, "Crime does pay, not crime doesn't pay, but crime does pay, uh, especially cyber crime." And as the years go by, I still feel that is absolutely true. And these are the numbers to go and back it up. Um, relationship between security and business, folks. I mean, this is uh, just kind of an eye-popping comic that shows just how bad the problem is. A lot of the problem also doesn't help on the, with the technical folks that are working in cybersecurity, as I've, as I've seen so much in the past. There's always an emphasis on the tools and the technologies and the tech side of things. Um, but this is what happens if you only think about technology so much. Sometimes the solution is not technical. And um, also, when you you know when cybersecurity folks speak with board of director members and management, they generally speaking, most of them don't have any technical background. So we have a language issue and a communication problem that doesn't help the problem. You know, all in all, we're still facing a lot of these very common problems, and they're all extremely difficult to solve. Things like phishing and social engineering. I mean, that's a psychological issue. Data-driven attacks, uh, that includes SQL injections, you know, drone spoofing, you know, those are still, you know, we're still facing those, especially when you're dealing with legacy system. And how do you prevent bad inputs? You know, you can't trust anything that comes from, uh, any inputs that come from uh, some, some technology or some feed. Uh, password reuse, always a problem. And we're all guilty of this problem. Uh, distributed denial of service attack, bringing down computer systems with large amounts of network traffic. Well, the internet, when it was built, did not have, was not built on security in mind. And so the infrastructure, the architecture of the internet, you know, it's, you know, it did, was not built with security in mind. Uh, attribution, who did what? Physical attribution is well known. If a plane goes down, if a plane gets shot down, you can do a lot of different, you can have a lot of different measurements to actually see what happened. Um, you know, you can measure like the, uh, where, what part of the plane got hit, uh, the debris from the missile, you name it. Not true when it comes to cyber attribution. Writing secure code that does what people want at the end of the day, still a very, very challenging problem. It doesn't help when we have an education problem. Most people walking out of computer science don't know any basics. They don't even know a thing about how to even do uh, what basic security is. Uh, and this is this last thing, connecting with what I learned from Gary McGraw and Ed Felton 15 years ago, is to talk to people who are curious. You know, inform others, be a good citizen especially with the policy makers and um, non-technical folks, the general audience, you know, connect uh, communications. Um, very, very hard problem. And why did I highlight that in italics is because, you know, how we at Tufts are going, are going about this problem. I want to tell, talk to you about cybersecurity and policy here at Tufts and what we are doing. And why policy? Well, because policy and legislation plays a heavy hand. Um, right now, you know, there's been uh, senators are introducing, uh, well, they did introduce uh, Internet of Things legislation to improve the cybersecurity of the Internet of Things. Uh, last, late last year, uh, there was, of course, in Australia, um, you know, lawmakers decided to, quote, unquote, ban or weaken uh, encryption and to give uh, law enforcement deeper access um, to uh, technological devices, uh, infrastructure, including things like phones, which, of course, that makes you question, if we can't even trust, how are we going to trust our own computing devices and systems if this kind of things happen? Policy 
plays and legislation plays a very, very heavy hand. So why, why cybersecurity and policy at Tufts? I mean, why us? Why should we delve into this? Well, a couple of reasons. Number one, what are our strengths at Tufts? Our strengths are in international relations, uh, political science, active citizenship, and computer science, which is now the largest major at the whole university. So also, each and every one of those groups have a vested interest in cybersecurity. I mean, I've worked with Fletcher for over five years now, and Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy started talking about cybersecurity from policy's perspective as early as 2011, 2012. Um, what was interesting was I, at that time, I did meet with Fletcher a few times. And um, it was interesting to hear a lot of what the students were saying. Uh, they were drafting up. But a lot of the policies and a lot of the writings made no sense because these people did not, the students did not have a technical underpinning because it makes absolutely no sense to talk about cybersecurity if you don't have like the basic technical underpinnings. Especially when you're, when you're doing that with policy, it's very, very dangerous. In computer science, you know, I've been always interested and in, I've been always working on cybersecurity for well over 15 years now. And I noticed that, you know, I, I've noticed that the technology is not everything. And it really rooted in what I've learned from Gary and from Ed is that, you know, the education piece, the, 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 especially when it comes to policy and lawmakers, that was the issue that was always I've known was the real sticking point. And so 2014, 2015 came along. I said, you know what? We're, I'm talking about cybersecurity. Fletcher's talking about cybersecurity. Um, and interestingly enough, I found out, you know, a little bit later on that cybersecurity and cyber warfare were actually in their strategic plan for faculty research and teaching. Why not are we why aren't we doing something together to tackle this problem? Why aren't we utilizing and playing to our strengths? Uh, especially in the School of Engineering strategic plan is to educate engineers on ethical applications in science and societal needs. Why aren't we working together on cybersecurity and policy at top? Also, the whole idea of leadership is in our DNA. So we want to take the lead on cybersecurity and policy at Tufts. And you may be wondering, what have we, what have we uh, accomplished so far? Uh, 2017, we hired uh, Susan Landau, who is now bridge professor in cybersecurity and policy. It's a bridge appointment between the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy and the School of Engineering. So she's working for both, both schools. Uh, we have a number of new courses in cybersecurity, uh, including cybersecurity and cyber warfare, which is a joint course between uh, computer science uh, and the political science departments. Uh, Susan has created a number of courses on privacy in, the, uh, privacy in the digital age, cyber law, and cyber in the civil sector, uh, and also reverse engineering. I'm also happy to say that my introduction to cybersecurity course is now offered as an online course during the summer uh, since 2007. Same exact course as a classroom that is a course that is offered in the fall. We have a program website now on cybersecurity at policy at Tufts, which is https colon slash slash sites dot tufts dot edu slash cybersecurity. Um, Back in September, the Fletcher School had an inaugural conference on protecting civilian institutions for an infrastructure from cyber operations, designing international law and organizations. Uh, we posted a, uh, workshops, uh, special guests, including uh, one of the co-founders of, uh, of uh, CrowdStrike, um, policy leaders from the Bank of America and New America. Uh, we've had uh, career panels. By, as of a, a month ago, a computer science department rolled out a new cybersecurity focus area. And I'm also happy to say that this was a very brand new news. Um, the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy just recently hired, within the last two weeks, 
brand new hire, a new assistant professor in cybersecurity policy, and she will be joining us uh, this fall. Uh, in terms of student competitions, uh, what have we done? Well, in terms of a student competition, uh, we have had not one, but we have had two teams that have made the semifinal round of the Atlantic Council Cyber 912 student competition, which is a policy, uh, cybersecurity policy competition that is held, uh, that is held. I think the, uh, uh, the spring is in Washington, D.C. The fall is in New York City. Uh, also, we have been uh, students in computer science and computer engineering. We have uh, participated and, more importantly, placed in the MITRE Embedded Capture the Flag competition. So this is both a hardware and software-based uh, competition for cybersecurity. Uh, the inaugural uh, competition was in 2016. We placed in that one. We won an award for Iron Flag because no one could get into it, can actually steal stuff from, uh, what was it that we built at that time? Oh, it was, um, it was a smart door. And 2018, uh, last year, we, uh, we came in second place um, in the competition. We narrowly lost out to Virginia Tech. Current research and projects at Tufts contain, uh, pertaining to cybersecurity and policy. Um, we have uh, twice a month research meetings uh, at uh, Fletcher uh, School of Engineering and Political Science. This is a joint uh, set of research meetings uh, on cybersecurity and policy. Um, we have privacy and metadata research with a cybersecurity, uh, cybersecurity policy fellow right now. Um, uh, my colleague Jeff Foster is working on Android security. And one thing that I completely forgot to put here is what Kathleen Fisher is working on. Um, and she spoke about this at Tufts Talk in Boston, and she will be uh, giving a few more uh, Tufts Talks. Um, I think one of them is in Los San, San Francisco, and uh, one will be in New York, and her work on formal methods and uh, car hacking. So what does the future look like for cybersecurity and policy at Tufts? There are some things that I can't say, but what I can tell you is we have an upcoming student symposium in cybersecurity policy in the first weekend of April. We will be offering a brand new course uh, starting in the fall called Computer Science for Future Presidents. So this is going to be a course that's going to cover a lot of important topics that you know, future presidents need to know at a high level, things like what is machine learning? What is artificial intelligence? What is basic cybersecurity? What is cryptography? All of these basic issues that will help the future president make better policies, better policies in the future. And we are in the process, uh, computer science, uh, and hiring a, another faculty focusing on security and systems like networks. So what are my personal tips? Um, if you want to hear any personal tips from me in terms of cybersecurity, uh, I've hammered home the importance of uh, credentials, username and passwords, and that's just paramount. I mean, how most people still get break in, how most attackers break into system, weak credentials. Uh, credentials management is uh, absolutely going to be critical. Um, look, the bottom line is, is for any username, for any password, it's going to be broken. It's only going to be a matter of time. What does that mean? Well, time can be like mean from anywhere between a few seconds to a few hours or to a few years or even a few millennia. It doesn't matter what, uh, what it is. It's just going to be a, a matter of time. So credentials management, you know, assuming that your password is always going to be broken into. So always have a second factor, um, a second factor of authentication. I use uh, Dual. Uh, you can use things like Authy or Google Authenticator, where you enter in your username and password, but after you successfully enter in your username and password, um, you are presented the option. Well, you have to enter this token, this uh, six-digit code or something. Okay. Password managers are very good. They're not. For, I mean, they have vulnerabilities, but it's still you know it's still better than the password reuse problem. Okay. Um, if you want to go a step up, you can use this hardware key, 
where it's called a FIDO key. This is called a universal two factor, or the universal uh, second factor. So what it is is a USB key that you plug into your computer and you use your uh, thumbprint. You use a fingerprint to uh, log uh, to log in. So you enter in your username and password first. Then you plug in your your, your key. Press press. Uh, there's a little um, there's a little thing on the key. You press the uh, fingerprint. You're in. Uh, update your systems uh, software and systems if you have the ability to do so. Look, software always going to have bugs because the complexity problem. Um, the best thing that you have to do plug those holes, uh, patch your systems. This includes iOS app, Android app, mobile apps. Um, and I made the note if you have the ability to do so because earlier I did mention that. Um, there are some things, some especially like Internet of Things devices, that have the username and password that are just locked into the hardware. I mean, it is what it is, and you can't change it. Understand your own threat model. Uh, know who you are and what's important to you. So the point is, is that you know a lot of people think you know, oh, you're gonna, well, you know, I'm gonna be a target of China. I'm gonna be a target of you know this country or, or whatever. But the problem is. You know, everyone has a different threat model, okay? Um, you know, in terms of, there was a, what's the analogy here? The analogy is, is that um, this certain thing will happen to you. Yeah, sure, but what are the risks of that happening? Um, for example, uh, heart disease. And that's, 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 that's something to, to, to worry about. That affects a lot more people percentage-wise uh, in risk. So there are some risks that are much, much lower for certain people. Question everything, especially uh, electronic information. Um, there's an old ad, don't click on links on emails, especially from uh, people that you don't know. Um, that's what anything, any electronic information, email, text messages, question everything. Um, because you just don't know who really, really, really sent it. Um, and finally, last but not least, is what I call less is more. Um, ask yourself this. Do you really need to buy that smart TV or that touchscreen refrigerator or seriously that pair of sneakers that require an internet update all the time? Do you really need it? The point being is, number one, you don't know where all the, your data is going. Number two, you know, you're just going to add more, more complexity to your life, more maintenance. So the more of these internet connected devices that you have, you're going to have to keep up with more upkeep. So less is more. So those are my personal tips. And with that, um, I'm going to open it up for a Q&A. Okay, so hello. So what we got? Do you think? Whoa. Sorry, one second. Which one? We're gonna go with the highlighted one, or we're gonna go with the docs? Excellent. All right. So question is, do you think there's a huge difference between software developers, uh, people who learn the code, or software engineers? Well, here's the difference between software developers. There is a, I do think there is a big difference between developers and engineers. Developers, all you're going to do is code. All you need to do is, what I mean by uh, code is program. You're given the instructions, you're given a, a specification, or you're given a blueprint of what to follow, you follow it. That's a developer. You can, anyone can be a software developer. But a software engineer is the one that have to make decisions. An engineer is someone that have to make decisions, even architecture, and more importantly, even documentation. I know that um, the higher that you go in the software engineering profession, um, the less code that you have to write and the more documentation and architecture that you have to do. But in either case, um, both developers and engineers, right now as we speak, it doesn't matter which one, there is a difference. Um, there is almost, you know, their knowledge of security is, is really, really low. They're, that's a similarity in terms of the security problem. Okay, next one. How do we know, even know if our systems or information have been active? 
In other words, what detective step can one take to find out if the security comp <laughs> the, 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 the uh, security has been compromised? Well, honestly, an old friend of mine said, you know, he assumed that all every computer had been broken into. That's an assumption. The basic assumption is always assume there are going to be vulnerabilities. You know, your systems are going to be broken into. It's not a matter of if, it's just going to be a matter of when. Um, where was the doc? Wait, can you go back up? There was a, there, there was a question. I, 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 I didn't get the second part of it. Oh. So go back to the Word document. Go back up. Go back up. Um, yeah, have, uh, you know, how do you find out your security has been compromised? Um, well, again, as I said, you always assume that your systems are going to be compromised in some way. Um, the ways that you can find out if your security has been compromised at a very basic level, if something is terribly wrong, such as you're getting like interesting credit card bills, um, applica like document like documents and emails that you don't usually get, that's a sign. Um, the other sign of you know your security having compromised, um, you can go on to uh, website like Have I Been Pwned, P W N E D. Uh, you can check uh, your email have been used in a data breach. Um, the other thing is for say, security have been compromised, follow the news. Take a look at yourself, like do a Google search of yourself on not only social media, but, um, but Google as well. So those are the steps that you can find out if your security have been compromised. As an individual, well, the simple and most important step we can secure our information, well, I mentioned that earlier on. Um, number one, I mean, I mentioned that earlier before. Number one, protect, protect your credentials used to factor authentication. Um, number two, you know, less is more. Don't put stuff on the Internet that you don't want to, that you like, you know, that, that those pictures uh, that... Um, the, those pictures that you, you know, may think that are very interesting, just don't post them up. Be very judicious. Um, the other thing is support to more, the, what I do, another important step to uh, secure your information, monitor your accounts, such as well, like things like Gmail, your online banking. Log on, monitor them like a hawk. Like keep your eye on the money. Keep your eye on, um, you know, especially if they have like, audit logs like they do in Gmail. This is, uh, there, there's a little uh, thing that you click on and say, where did you last log into? If you see anything suspicious, I'm take them off. Okay, so here's the question. Can you hypothesize a bit why gender disparities in cybersecurity are a problem? Um, beyond the socialist, societal issues, which is obvious, why does it matter for security outcomes? Well, because here's the one thing. This is the uh, one thing I can tell you is if you only have certain gender, certain, you know, they don't bring the perspective. And again, as I mentioned on the first slide, that cybersecurity is a very broad field. It's a very broad field that contains that, you know, that encompasses many different, not only many disciplines, but also um, factors as well too, such as uh, human factors and um, in things like gender. So you don't have uh, if you don't have the perspective, especially of the women, you don't solve a lot of the you know you, you, you miss a lot uh, uh, you miss a lot uh, of different opinions. That's number one. And another thing, if you have a gender disparity, you, you know. If you hear that, oh, only so many females that uh, in, in cybersecurity, and you're a woman, and you're looking at those numbers, it just scares you away. Then you really don't want to just, you just tell, you, tell, tell people, this is not the field to get into. It's only making the problem worse. Uh, here it is. How would you recommend uh, cybersecurity companies to improve their recruitment practices that encourage more female hire? This is not an easy question to answer at all. Um, 
And uh, let me read down. She says, my daughter's a freshman at Tufts. How can I uh, help Tufts to inform her, possibly motivate uh, about cybersecurity? That question is a little bit easier for me um, to answer, um, a lot easier for me to answer. Uh, talk to me, talk to Kathleen Fisher, talk to Susan Landau. Um, though that's the best way, that come talk to us, and I'm happy. Uh, I tell this a lot of people, there's always two things that I absolutely never, ever mind answering. There's two people, I said two things I never, ever mind talking about. One is careers, number two is cybersecurity. Um, so talk to good people, motivate uh, that possibly, you know, c come to me. Come to talk to people like Kathleen and, and Susan. Uh, but going back to your question about how companies can improve their recruitment pa uh, practices and encourage more female hires. I mean, the one thing I've seen is uh, things like what Deidre Diamond, Kathleen Smith are doing at cybersecurity conferences, and they're um, hosting a lot of special events uh, and talks. Um, yeah, it having having good role models. Um, you know, in terms of what companies got to do, having good role models, especially women women um, role model goes a long, long, long way. Um, start there. Start there. And I even have former students that have said that, you know, they wish when they were here at Tufts they had more of those role models to follow, especially um, for tech. Okay. If you are, here's a question, if you're developing within a specific platform using its own set of APIs, how much security risk are you, are on you as a developer? And how much of the risk is assumed by the platform? In my case, it is a popular cloud-based ERP system. Uh, it goes both ways. Uh, it goes both ways. Um, can you go back? Yep. How much security risks are on you as a developer? I mean, a lot. You can't assume, you know, the problem is, is that if you're using um, its own set of APIs, you can't assume that it is secure. You have to assume that, well, you're, you're, you're giving a lot of trust in this case to Oracle. And this is the problem with using APIs and other people's software is you just don't know what goes on behind the scene. This is the dependency problem. And now we're in a model where we're using other people's API, other people's framework, other people's tool. We're just taking a lot for granted. And you can't have much trust in other people's work and, uh, other people's work and software. And as for you, as how much is assumed, you still have to make sure that, well, if people are going to be entering inputs and stuff into your system and then have to send it to the API, that's still on you. Input validation is still on you, but it's a two way. It's, it goes both ways. Okay, another question. If the mood strikes, you can you go back to the evac attack vector slide and walk through what they are and how they impact individuals can mitigate risk. And for one more, can you go down the business leaders who aren't going to talk? Um, one six uh, take my security course, what should they know and how can they build knowledge to be responsible and aware of cybersecurity principles? Uh, for business leaders who aren't going to take my security course and they want to know more about cybersecurity, uh, you know, about, go, go back up, right there, right there, that's good. Uh, what should they know and how can they be responsible for knowledge that they are in a way of cybersecurity principles? Well, one, if you're going to be a business leader, is to hopefully some table, get involved in tabletop exercises. You know, it's not reading, but it's real hands-on activities. Uh, I, a lot of companies do this, for example, like a fishing exercise. Um, right there, here's your exercise, you receive an email from so-and-so. Um, and so what you have to do, what they do is they, they make sure that you don't fall for a phishing scam. 
And so taking part, having that as part of your company culture and you getting involved in those tabletop exercises and to think about those in there, just to be aware. This is not going to be reading, but this is a hands-on exercise to help you understand the security principles. Cybersecurity is a very hands-on field, and to really understand and to be aware of the issues, it is not only important to talk about them, but more important to get hands-on experience. Um, can you go back up? Uh, right there, right there. So walk through and uh, what they are and how they impact individuals and how a company can mitigate the risk. Um, well, a lot of my, yeah, sure, I can talk about my attack vectors, what they are. A lot of it is credentials, uh, a lot of credential-based stuff. So having weak passwords, obviously a bad thing. So what can individuals and companies, what can companies, how can they mitigate the risk? Um, less is more, which is don't give anyone administrative access. That's important. And so companies can mitigate risk by auditing the permissions that people have to assist the internal system. That's one. Um, also, things like clean desk policies, make sure that no one is posting st uh, passwords as sticky notes. That stuff happens. That recently made the news, uh, uh, made the news recently. Those things, um, even those little things are important. Uh, because once someone gets a hand on a password, username and password credential, oh, actually, interestingly enough, there is a username and password credential right here on the, on the, uh, on the computer. Um, those will open up a lot of holes. So it's companies auditing, especially at the credentials and account level. Um, how about uh, in terms of individuals, I mentioned two-factor authentication. Uh, we have that now. It's actually mandatory at Tufts, and I've been getting into the habit of using this for uh, for many, many years. But for people, for, for us, it's like hygiene, muscle memory. Next question. Oh, whoa, whoa, here it is. What do you think about paid services such as LifeLock that monitors uh, your, oh boy, uh, <laughs> monitors your credit? Are they safer than checking TransUnion? Uh, yeah, well, I, I'm happy to answer this question because I know that people already have a lot of difficulties even using um, credit monitoring system. And in fact, there's a lot of issues um, getting into Equifax. I mean, even the Equifax system that are actually uh, that are actually a way you just the, the system where you log into to go and lock your your credit. Uh, that's actually pretty broken. Life lock that monitors your credit. Uh, I've heard dubious things about them. Uh, I don't use them. Very very. I mean they're very dubious. Um, I do check my credit score every so often. That I can tell you, but I don't pay a fee uh, for things like TransUnion or Life Lock at all. I just have very little trust uh, in a lot of companies. Next question. What can you do to prevent people from hacking your laptop and then be able to see through your camera? Uh, how would you know that if your computer camera has been hacked? Well, this is a computer camera. So uh, I've actually done this before, and there is a reason why people put those, um, you know, those nice little, nice little stickers on the cameras. I've actually brought, uh, broken into one of those uh, for an exercise before. Uh, checked into someone's webcam, and there's a reason for it, and uh, those vulnerabilities definitely exist. So can you go back right to that quote? How would you know if your computer camera has been hacked? Um, here's the thing. It's very hard to. Uh, even now, um, there's a lot of incidents where the webcam is actually working, and there's no notification. There's no light on the camera. Um, you just, you know, how would you know if your computer camera is a Mac? Honestly, I just assume that it already has been. Um, prevent people from hacking your laptop and then seeing through your computer camera. Uh, seeing through your computer camera. Again, I mean, I, there's a reason why people use those little uh, protective uh, strips uh, on the camera. Uh, I, I have them. 
Uh, I know I've broken into a camera before uh, for an exercise, and uh, this stuff ha this stuff happened. I just assumed that's already been broken into. Next question: Can you go into the new risks that are? Oh yeah, can you go into the new risks that the public introduced by elastic cloud computing and virtual machines as they relate to related to public use and blue pilling? What businesses and end users can do for ver for safety when they don't secure virtual machines? Um, a lot of there's been a lot of incidents right now with public cloud, uh, EC2 instances not locked down correctly. What can businesses and end users do for safety when they don't secure uh, virtual machines? Well, yeah. I mean, the first thing that comes to mind if, if it doesn't need to be on an in if it doesn't need to be on the internet, then there's no reason why it should be. Uh, anything that is made unavailable on the internet has already been scanned. And already made the information has already been made available to services like Shodan. So bottom line, if it doesn't need to be on the need, if it doesn't need to be on the internet, shouldn't be there. Go back up to the uh, to the question. Um, virtual machines as they are related to public use. Yeah, don't post virtual machines that to the internet that shouldn't be there. Um, you know, it would help if you, you're going to use things like, uh, like for example, like Vagrant. Every so often, re, if it's possible, although this could be costly uh, for business purposes, is, you know, patch the virtual machines and every so often rebuild them if you can. But bottom line is, if it doesn't need to be on the Internet, it shouldn't be there. Next. Why do you think sexual harassment against women is such a current occurrence in, in cybersecurity IT field? Well, there was a great article um, in the New York Times about back a long time ago. Um, programming was a was a women field, and of course something happened along the way. Um, I think a lot of it. You know, it's, I can tell you, again, women are such a, why is this such a problem in IT? You can make a lot of things, but I certainly a couple of things that come to mind, culture. Um, number one is the, is, is, the, is, the, is the constant culture. Number two, alcohol doesn't help us all. Uh, I see, I mean, if you go on social media, go to a lot of tech places, you know, alcohol is very, is very, very prevalent. Um, also, you know, they a lot of people just don't know any better. Um, a lot of people, you know, we hear it about that all the way, all all in the news. But when it comes to the engineering and the software field, um, at the academic level, a lot of people just don't know that these problems even exist. So what I do on the second day of all my classes is I give a public service announcement to each of my classes, each semester and the second day about uh, sexual harassment, about this problem. Absolutely, it's, it's, it's a no-no. So it's just a part of it is the awareness. Do you feel it occurs greater frequency in this field as uh, opposed to other fields and industry? And the answer is, oh yeah. People just, there's a lot of immaturity. There's absolutely a lot of immaturity. Um, that doesn't help. Now we can do one more question. Be happy to. Can you simply cover a camera with your piece of camera in order to protect it from the camera when you're not using it? Well, it's just again, we're talking. This is a we're talking about a camera. Um, but you know, in terms of a camera, yeah, you know, it's. It's it's just a camera. You cover it. It it doesn't work. But you, but we also have to mention about other other things such as of course a microphone and stuff as well too. So that always can be that can be vulnerable. You don't even know if the microphone is, is on at at times. Um, but again, you have to assume. You know what I do is assume that the camera has already been is is already vulnerable. That someone is already looking looking into it. Um, if there is definitely a way that I can buy a laptop or you know or a machine without a camera, I certainly would do that. Um, so even if you cover the tape, yeah, I mean there's a lot of paranoia here, 
But, you know, even though you cover your camera, you, what about the other things like the microphone and other, comp other components that you don't know what's going on? And that's it. We're out of time. Okay. We hope you enjoyed our webinar today. As a reminder, for any questions in the Q&A box that were unaddressed, we will share as many answers as possible with you in an email. You will receive an email shortly with a link to a brief survey. Please take a few minutes to complete the survey as we do value your feedback. This email will also contain a link to today's presentation material. If you'd like to learn more about cybersecurity, please consider joining our upcoming live events featuring President Anthony Monaco and Computer Science Chair and Professor Kathleen Fisher. They will, they will be held on March 19th in Los Angeles and March 20th in San Francisco. The link to RSVP for either event will be included in the email that you will receive shortly. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you.